Ladies and gentlemen, there is nothing grander in this world than to rescue from the leprosy of slander a great and splendid name. There is nothing nobler than to benefit our benefactors. The infidels of one age have been the aureal saints of the next. The destroyers of the old have always been the creators of the new. The old passes away and the new becomes old. There is, in the intellectual world as in the material, decay and growth, and even by the sunken grave of age stand youth and joy. The history of progress is written in the lives of infidels. Political rights have been preserved by traitors, intellectual rights by infidels. To attack the kings was treason, to dispute the priests, blasphemy. The sword and cross have always been allies. They defended each other. The throne and altar are twins, vultures born of the same egg. It was James I who said, No king, no bishop, no church, no crown, no tyrant in heaven, no tyrant on earth. Every monarchy that has disgraced the world, every despotism that has covered the cheeks of men with fear, has been copied after the supposed despotism of hell. The king owned the bodies, and the priest owned the souls. One lived on taxes, and the other on alms. One was a robber, and the other a beggar. The history of the world will not show you one charitable beggar. He who lives on charity never has anything to give away. The robbers and beggars controlled not only this world, but the next. The king made laws, the priest made creeds. With bowed backs, the people received and bore the burdens of the one, and with the open mouth of wonder, the creed of the other. If any aspired to be free, they were crushed by the king, and every priest was a hero who slaughtered the children of the brave. The king ruled by force, the priest by fear and by the Bible. The king said to the people, God made you peasants and me a king. He clothed you in rags and housed you in hovels. Upon me he put robes and gave me a palace. Such is the justice of God. The priest said to the people, God made you ignorant and vile, me holy and wise. Obey me, or God will punish you here and hereafter. Such is the mercy of God. Infidels are the intellectual discoverers. Infidels have sailed the unknown sea and have discovered the isles and continents in the vast realms of thought. What would the world have been had infidels never existed? What the infidel is in religion, the inventor is in mechanics. What the infidel is in religion, the man willing to fight the hosts of tyranny is in the political world. An infidel is a gentleman who has discovered a fact and is not afraid to tell about it. There has been for many thousands of years an idea prevalent that in some way you can prove whether the theories defended or advanced by a man are right or wrong by showing what kind of a man he was, what kind of a life he lived, and what manner of death he died. There is nothing to this. It makes no difference what the character of the man was who made the first multiplication table. It is absolutely true and whenever you find an absolute fact, it makes no difference who discovered it. The golden rule would have been just as good if it had been first whispered by the devil. It is good for what it contains, not because a certain man said it. Gold is just as good in the hands of crime as in the hands of virtue. Whatever it may be, it is gold. A statement made by a great man is not necessarily true. A man entertains certain opinions, and then he is proscribed because he refuses to change his mind. He is burned to ashes, and in the midst of the flames he cries out that he is of the same opinion still. Hundreds then say that he has sealed his testimony with his blood, and that his doctrines must be true. All the martyrs in the history of the world are not sufficient to establish the correctness of any one opinion. 
Martyrdom, as a rule, establishes the sincerity of the martyr, not the correctness of his thought. Things are true or false independently of the man who entertains them. Truth cannot be affected by opinion. An error cannot be believed sincerely enough to make it the truth. No Christian will admit that any amount of heroism displayed by a Mormon is sufficient to show that Joseph Smith was an inspired prophet. All the courage and culture, all the poetry and art of ancient Greece do not even tend to establish the truth of any myth. The testimony of the dying concerning some other world, or in regard to the supernatural, cannot be any better than that of the living. In the early days of Christian experience, an intrepid faith was regarded as a testimony in favor of the church. No doubt in the arms of death, many a one went back and died in the lay of the old faith. After a while, Christians got to dying and clinging to their faith. And then it was that Christians began to say, No man can die serenely without clinging to the cross. According to the theologians, God has always punished the dying who did not happen to believe in him. As long as men did nothing except to render their fellow men wretched, God maintained the strictest neutrality. But when some honest man expressed a doubt as to the Jewish scriptures, or prayed to the wrong God, or to the right God by the wrong man, then the real God leaped like a wounded tiger upon this dying man, and from his body tore his wretched soul. There is no recorded instance where the uplifted hand of murder has been paralyzed, or the innocent have been shielded by God. Thousands of crimes are committed every day, and God has no time to prevent them. He is too busy numbering hairs and matching sparrows. He is listening for blasphemy. He is looking for persons who laugh at priests. He is examining baptismal registers. He is watching professors in colleges who begin to doubt the geology of Moses or the astronomy of Joshua. All kinds of criminals, except infidels, meet death with reasonable serenity. As a rule, there is nothing in the death of a pirate to cast discredit upon his profession. The murderer upon the scaffold smilingly exhorts the multitude to meet him in heaven. The Emperor Constantine, who lifted Christianity into power, murdered his wife and oldest son. Now and then, in the history of the world, there has been a man of genius, a man of intellectual honesty. These men have denounced the superstition of their day. They were honest enough to tell their thoughts. Some of them died naturally in their beds, but it would not do for the church to admit that they had died peaceably. That would show that religion was not necessary in the last moments. The first grave, the first cathedral, the first corpse was the first priest. If there was no death in the world, there would be no superstition. The church has taken great pains to show that the last moments of all infidels have been infinitely wretched. Upon this point, Catholics and Protestants have always stood together. They are no longer men. They become hyenas. They dig open graves. They devour the dead. It is an auto da fe presided over by God and his angels. These men believed in the accountability of men in the practice of virtue and justice. They believed in liberty, but they did not believe in the inspiration of the Bible. That was their crime. In order to show that infidels died overwhelmed with remorse and fear, they have generally selected from all the infidels since the days of Christ until now five men. The Emperor Julian, Bruno, Diderot, David Hume, and Thomas Paine. They forget that Christ himself was not a Christian, that he did what he could to tear down the religion of his day that he held the temple in contempt. I like him because he held the old Jewish religion in contempt, because he had sense enough to say that doctrine was not true. 